So grateful for you to be gathered with us online right now, uh, joining us and continuing uh, during our series, A Piece of Heaven. Before I get there, I know many of you have heard the announcement, if you live in Virginia, uh, our governor is discouraging any gatherings beyond 25 people. I want to assure you, uh, praise God, that does not include churches, okay? Churches are excluded from that, and uh, the governor's office has confirmed that. Um, that is true, so those of you who are praying, church, thank you for your prayers. Um, we can still continue to do uh, what God has called us to do boldly, and we believe that God is going to continue to advance his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen? Amen. You can type amen in the chat if you're watching with us, even if you don't live in Virginia. Maybe you live in Florida and you're like, we're great. You know, I don't know uh, where you're watching from, but we're so grateful that you're here with us. I want to also assure you that we will continue for every public gathering to be diligent and detailed in all of our cleaning, in physical distancing, in wearing masks, in doing things. We don't, a lot of us, some of you hate wearing masks, but you do it because you appreciate and love your neighbor and you take care of others or you want them to feel comfortable. Um, we're going to continue to take precautions. And to date, uh, I don't need to knock on wood. I just need to trust God. But to date, uh, by God's grace, we have not had one incident of COVID because of a gathering at WIAG or tied to any gathering of West End Assembly of God in any of our services or the things that we're gathering for. And I praise God for that. I'm not saying it's not impossible that it doesn't happen. I'm saying that God's in control. He's still going to use West End Assembly of God, our gatherings to advance his gospel. And those of you who feel comfortable coming in and joining us or you're joining us online, but you are gathering together the church is not a building. You, I, we are the church. But the gathering of his people is important. So I'm grateful for those who do all the work, who are our maintenance team, who literally clean this worship center completely. Every room that's used, every space that's, cre uh, that's used, every footprint that's left is completely and totally sanitized. Can we take a moment and celebrate an incredible maintenance team throughout COVID time? <laughs> yeah, they've been amazing. And uh, we're going to continue to do that kind of work so that uh, you can be safe and we can not just care for your soul, we can care for you physically and meet needs as well. I have so much on my heart that I want to say regarding this topic in the next part of our series, A Piece of Heaven. If you're just joining us, we've been in this series. A Piece of Heaven is the hope that heaven can come down. It can be peace in my soul. And then I can be the peace of heaven that our world is missing. That's our hope. That's the point of this series and what I hope is reaching the point in your heart as well as we pray as Jesus taught us. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today, I want to talk to you about this topic, the power, the power of small things. That works out great because I'm small in stature, so, okay, uh, I, I appreciate um, every now and then when you do the, when they do the, the camera that looks up at me, you know, because everyone I always meet always says, wow, I thought you were a lot taller. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea what to expect from you, but 
I don't think I had to say it out loud, but hey, that's just me. Um, but uh, I always get that on a regular basis, and I thought you would be taller because you they watch me on a screen or something. I, I think there's power in small things, not just because I'm small, but because Jesus taught this principle. And I don't think we celebrate enough the small things in life. In our world, we celebrate big things. We celebrate great accomplishment. We celebrate the top. We celebrate the best of the best. We celebrate accomplishments that seem impossible, that, that we love to cheer for. But even in the church, I think at times, we miss celebrating a life of faithfulness, the little things, the small things, and the faithfulness that generates a future of greatness in the economy of the kingdom of heaven. I want to talk to you about the power of small things. I'll never forget my mentor, uh, Dr. David Mercer, um, who was a pastor, those of you who remember uh, Pastor Mercer, raise your hand, uh, Pastor Mercer, yeah, uh, we love him so much, those of you online, if you remember Pastor Mercer, uh, I, I love Pastor Mercer to this day, he's one of my mentors, but he, he preached a sermon, and maybe some of you will remember it, he preached a sermon, and he gave us all O-rings, O-rings, if any of you remember this little tiny piece of rubber that was formed to be an O-ring on the 1986 Challenger was the reason for the explosion that lost the lives of seven astronauts who became infamous in this moment. And as we think about that, there is a power of small things, both in the great and the tragic, isn't there? It doesn't take large things. Sometimes it takes just a small thing. And today I want to talk to you about the small things and the power of small things in your life, in the economy of the kingdom of heaven. Here's what Matthew chapter 13, going back to these great parables that we started with um, a few weeks ago. Jesus says this, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He gives us a formula right here. And three aspects of this parable that I want us to talk about today of the power of small things. First, first to plant a seed. To plant a seed. It seems so insignificant. Now, in this agricultural illustration that Jesus was often using, he would use the agricultural to demonstrate the power of the kingdom of heaven. But in the agricultural world, planting seeds is not something that's probably um, uh, deliberated over. Uh, it is happening all the time, and they're planting and continuing to prepare the ground and plant the seeds. And then this interesting dynamic that's often used actually in scripture and, and many times in Jesus' audience, a mustard seed would represent something so small and seemingly insignificant. In fact, it's only one or two centimeters uh, large, uh, a mustard seed. And uh, he, this idea of planting a mustard seed doesn't seem that significant. But he says to plant it in his field. He took it and planted it in his 
field this small mustard seed. I brought a picture with me of that so you can get an idea of how small a mustard seed is. Again, it's one or two centimeters. It's packed with nutrients. And this tiny seed becomes a plant, the largest plant in the garden. So large that it actually turns into a tree that the birds can perch on its branches. It's used, of course, uh, for many things and harvested for uh, lots of nutrients and ingredients that are important to our bodies, uh, but probably most of you are aware of the famous condiment that many of you use uh, called mustard, especially great on Philadelphia soft pretzels, I'm just saying. But this tiny, seemingly insignificant seed, he says, to plant in your field. When you do the small, God does the big. Not because of your great faith, but because he is a great God. When you do the small, God does the big. Not because of your great faith, but because he is a great God. Jesus' point wasn't the seed. Jesus' point was the kingdom. And as small and insignificant as this may seem to you, this little tiny seed that you will plant in your field, in your life, <laughs> will become greatness in the kingdom of heaven, not because of your great faith, but because he is a great God and his kingdom come, his will be done on earth isn't because he and I agree or because I have great faith to call it down. It's because I only have to have this much faith. You know, I didn't know a lot when I first heard the gospel. I didn't know a lot. I didn't even fully comprehend it all. I, I remember being at camp and I just knew that, that I had no way to get to God in relationship and that he had come to me and, and, and the preacher preached that message from Romans and that all of us have come short of the glory of God in Romans chapter 3. By the time he got to Romans chapter 5, he said, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. I heard it in the King James Version, forgive me, but that's the way I remember it. And so he preached that day, by the time he got to Romans chapter 6, he said to me that this is the truth of God, that, that the wages, what I earn for my sin, the wages of sin is death, spiritual separation from God, that I can't get there on my own. And he went on to say Paul's other words to the church at Ephesians, that he would say this, that it's not by works of righteousness, not by great things that I have done, but according to his mercy, he saved me by the washing of his blood. He regenerated me. And then he went back to Romans chapter 6 and he finished chapter 6, verse 23. He said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Because of your great faith? No. It is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then it hit me. I don't have to try and work my way to heaven. In fact, I can't. In fact, that would be insulting. Because Jesus sent, came and died for me. God gave his only son. He so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting faith. And so 
I just had this much understanding. So I went forward at that camp, or I went back to the back, actually. And I went out of the chapel with the counselor, and I sat down, and he reread those passages to me. And I memorized them on my, put them on my heart, because it's this little tiny piece of faith that says, I am in his kingdom and his family because of the greatness of God, not because of my great faith. I don't have to be a great person. I don't have to have a great faith. I just have to have the understanding of this one small thing. And you know that one small thing? Changed me forever. That one small thing? I've been explaining it, talking about it my whole life. I was so excited about that one small thing that when I got home, I had to tell everybody about it. I had to tell everybody. I didn't know any doctrine. I couldn't open God's word and tell you. I couldn't even find the passages that that pastor had shared. I didn't know where they came from. I didn't know anything about it. And I certainly didn't know uh, anything where to find Romans or Ephesians. or I didn't know where to find any of that. But I just told people, listen, I, I, Jesus came, he died for our sins and, and, and he, he's in heaven now and he was, he ra- he was risen and he's, he's alive and because he's alive, we can be alive and we can be with him, not because of us. You don't have to work your way there. You don't have to do any of that. You just have to believe this much. The amazing thing about a mustard seed is that once it's planted, it becomes the largest plant in the garden. Because it really changed me. And I'm here today, and over the last 30 years of ministry, I've preached that sermon thousands of times to tens of thousands of people. Not because of my great faith, because of this little, small moment that planted in my field, the kingdom of heaven is alive in me. And it can be alive in you. Not because of some great thing you do, not because you go to church, not because you give, not because you you do so many things for God. Not because you believe beyond everything else. Not because your faith is greater than anyone else's. But because of his greatness. You will see that seed grow. Let me ask you a question. Are are you planting a seed? Are you looking for something great today? Keep looking. There's only one great God. Your faith, even his closest followers, he said, you of little faith. And they watch the world change and they are the foundation of the church today because of this one small belief. Plant a seed. And number two, watch it grow. Here's what he says in verse 32. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants. Yet when it grows. Your own faith walk. You may think it's a small thing. To read your Bible and pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your, you don't know, you didn't go to kids' church, but back when I went to kids' church, that's what I'm saying. Pray every day and it grows, 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 and it grows, grows. Sorry, I won't do that anymore. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, it's just a small thing. Just read your Bible. Pray. 
Why don't I read the Bible? Well, because it's alive and it's God's word. Well, I don't know if I believe that. I know, just read it. You don't have to have a lot of faith. You don't have to have some amazing faith. You don't have to understand it all. You don't have to have some great faith to do one small thing and read one verse. You know, I'm not reading it all today. That's one more verse and you'll read any other time. Pick it up one verse. Go and put the Bible app on your phone that's free. Thank you to Life Church and thank you to those, uh, to, a, to an intern on a staff who had an idea, who put the Bible in an app. That one small thing that billions of a- a downloads have happened. I- I've got it on my phone. It has a verse of the day. It may be simple. Just read one verse. If that's not which is where you're starting, like, whoa, I'm going to be a really big Christian. I, I haven't really been reading my Bible. It's like, no, just, just read it. I, you don't need to read so much of it. You don't need to read whole chapters or whole books every day. That's awesome if you do that. It doesn't take a lot of faith. It doesn't take a lot of understanding. You don't have to have a degree. Read any version of it you want. I don't care. Just read it. Just pray. I don't know how to pray. Just talk. Just talk to God. Talk to Him. There's no, He didn't set rules that He wouldn't hear you if you pray a certain way or do it a certain way. Just pray. Say, I'm angry at God right now. Well, tell Him that. That's a, that's a great prayer. There are plenty of prayers in Scripture with people angry with God. You think 2020 was big? Read about some of these crises. You think 2020 is nothing. Let me tell you, there's some people confused in here during their prayers. I don't know if I can even pray right now. That's the perfect time to pray. It's just a small thing, but it turns into a great thing because he's a great God. Watch it grow. Watch it grow. And watch it grow. And watch it grow. And soon people will say, wow, you have a great faith. You'll be like, what? Why do you think I have a great faith? You read your Bible, you're always praying all the time. That's just a small thing. I have faith in a great God, though. And I'll brag about him to you all day. The prophet Zechariah spoke to, the, to Zerubbabel, and this is what the, the word of the Lord said in Zechariah chapter 4. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord for Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Who dares despise the day of small things? Pastor Mark Batterson was here, and uh, on our 50th anniversary, uh, our church turned 50 years old uh, last March, and we had a huge celebration uh, that lasted all week long, many different events, and one of those events was on a Thursday night, and you may not have been here. It was just an, a, a random Thursday night. It was when, when Dr. Batterson was available, so he came. He's a great friend of West End Assembly of God, and he actually references preached on this passage, and I, I would beg you to go listen to a fantastic sermon on our YouTube channel by Mark Batterson. Here's one of the things he said. When we do little things like they are big things, God does big things like they are little things. That's good, isn't it? You just need to do Something little like it's big deal, like it's a big deal. It's a big deal just to read my Bible and pray every day. And God does big things like they're little things. And then when you're praying over that big thing, God, I need a miracle. It's a good thing you're praying to him because he's a great God and that's all he does are miracles. Western Assembly of God, 51 years ago now, started with just 12 people. That first gathering, 
It was a snowy morning. They didn't cancel. <laughs> I can tell you that. It was the first one. But 12 people were there who signed the beginnings. And Dr. Bob Roden founded West End Assembly of God 51 years ago, 1969, with just 12 people. Ten years later, Pastor John Hirschman, his brother-in-law, who was the missions pastor, would have a vision that we would, as West End Assembly of God, we'd go, we wouldn't just send people around the world, but we would actually go ourselves. And 29 people, one of the very first West End Assembly of God missions trip to the Dominican Republic. And what was birthed were thousands of trips that this church would take and support over a hundred different ministries around the world. If you do little things like they're big things, God will do big things like they're little things. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Faith the size of a mustard seed. You know, Jesus talked about that two other times. Matthew chapter 17, actually. Right after uh, replying to the disciples in they were so confused as to why they couldn't cast out an evil spirit. And Jesus said this, well, it's because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Was Jesus saying their faith was even smaller than the smallest of mustard seeds? Is that what he was going for? Was he literally saying, pray to a mountain to move? I've been, I've been, I've driven through Colorado. I've, I've, I've done at least one 14er in my life. Okay, that, that's pretty amazing. I think Jesus' point that was actually used often, a mustard seed and a mountain were many times used to demonstrate my faith perhaps was either misplaced or not present. Perhaps it was misplaced in the fact that the disciples began to think, I'll just mimic Jesus. Jesus said, uh, Satan, leave. And he left. He spoke to the enemy. He spoke to Satan. He spoke to demons and commanded them to leave. And, and perhaps his disciples thought, I'll just mimic him. And Jesus maybe was making the point, this isn't something that you can pretend to have. This isn't something that you can have for your own self. This isn't something that makes you great, that makes you powerful. This isn't something that puts you in command of the enemy. This means that I am command and you must do it in Jesus name and you don't have to have a lot of faith in me you just have to have this much faith to believe it's not you it's God he's the one who commands all things remember I told you Daniel was going to be a backdrop for us a lot and and I'm re referencing it again uh, today Daniel chapter 2, uh, we hear the story of Daniel hearing about a dream and uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was threatening to kill every single wise person on his council, all of the wise men of the kingdom, because they could not interpret this dream. And once they heard that, suddenly they remembered Daniel and his three friends. So they went and found Daniel and said, we don't know what to do. He's going to kill everybody. Daniel said, don't worry. I'm on it. He did it. He said, don't worry. I'm going to go do a small thing right now. I'm going to pray. The same way I do every day. 
See, Daniel didn't have a lot of time in upbringing. and His parents didn't have him for his whole life, his young adult life, where the seed really took, took root. He had a moment because his parents were put into exile, into slavery, into another kingdom, and he was taken from his home and, and put into the king's court, a godless king and a godless society, and he had to serve this king who was now threatening everyone's life. Daniel just had this small seed of faith to know this, that you don't worship any other God but Yahweh. He is the one true God. And he had this small little seed in him. But we find out how big that seed grew. Daniel 2, then Daniel returns to his house. Let me read it to you. Daniel chapter 2, he returns to his house and explain the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Do you have some friends you can pray with? Do you have some friends you can pray with, you can trust, that they get that if they do the small things, God does the big things? He had these friends. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed. I, and my first question would be to Daniel. Daniel, why did you mention us? Like, they were on the chopping block. We were good. Why did you bring us into this? They didn't say that. That would have been me, I'm just saying. During the night, mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised God of heaven and said, listen, listen to this. Let, this. let this word of God flow over you today, wherever you're at, whatever you're worried about, whatever you're concerned about today. This is Daniel's praise to a great God. He says, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his he changes times and season. He disposes kings and raises up others. Are you grateful for that praise today? He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things, and he knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells in him. I thank and praise you, God, of my ancestors, that tiny seed that they planted in me. I think Daniel was referencing that seed, his parents, his, his ancestors, that seed that was planted, Yahweh is the one true God. You have given me wisdom and power, and you have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. And then he goes to the king. Now you can put it up, verse 26. The king asked him, can you interpret this dream or not? Stop messing with me. I'm about to kill everybody. By the way, read up the passage to it. Daniel went and reasoned with him. He just talked to the man. I'm just saying. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. I'm just saying, if your life is about to be taken, either you interpret this dream right or you die, no is probably not the way you want to start that conversation. Can you interpret the dream, Daniel? No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but... There is a God. Say, but there is a God. But there is a God. I'm in crisis. I'm in trial. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what this election means. I don't know what this pandemic will, when it will end or what will happen. I don't know what the governor will do. But there is a God. But there is a God. And if you'll do the small things and rely on him and just have this much faith in a great God, then he will do the great things. There is a God in heaven who reveals 
mysteries. Just the faith of a mustard seed. What do you need faith for today? What are you hoping to believe God for today? Once again, Jesus used, I told you he used it twice with his followers. In Luke chapter 17, he used it again. This time in response to his, hey Jesus, how many times should we forgive them? One time? How about seven times, Jesus? Because that sounds very spiritual. And Jesus said, how about 70 times seven? And they went, hmm, I'm going to need a little more faith for that, Jesus. You haven't met so-and-so. You haven't met who I'm trying to forgive. I'm going to need a lot more faith than that. And Jesus replies again, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, I don't know where they were standing, but there probably was a mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. I'm thinking mulberry bushes probably don't plant themselves anywhere, especially in the sea. But Jesus said, you just have to have this much faith. You have to have this much faith in a great God. Right now, today, what are you believing God for? What are you worried about? If we're worried, perhaps we're misplacing our faith today because we just have to have this much faith in a great God placed in the right source of power and wisdom. Plant a seed. Watch it grow. And number three, become a tree. It doesn't just become the largest plant in the garden. It becomes a tree. It becomes a tree. This great plant takes on the form of a great tree. But here's the powerful point that God spoke to me about this week. Is these two words. So that. And becomes a tree. Say with me. So that. It becomes a tree. So that the birds come and perch in its branches. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't always like going to church. Well, thankfully, we were one of them Christmas and Easter families, you know, so I only had to put up with it twice a year, but it was a big deal. Like, you know, nobody wanted to go. And then I tell you that story, how Jesus came into my life. And then I told him about this church. I said, yeah, we all got to go to this church, um, Calvary Baptist Church in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. This guy, I don't know, they call him the chief. I think he's a pastor. I don't know. He's crazy. Uh, he, but he told me. He told me about this. And, and he also told me there's going to be some special thing. Well, we went to that service, all six of us, not happy. Everybody was mad. Everybody, those, all, the, all my brothers and sisters, they were mad. They didn't want to be there. But we went. We sat. Right about where my parents are sitting right now, actually. Well, I don't know what they have with that second or third row. It's just something. I don't know uh, about the second or third row for them. It's just ingrained in them. I don't know. It's a small seed. That's a big tree now. So uh, but they took me to that church, and they're waiting. When's a special thing going to happen, Shane? They keep looking down the pew. I'm sitting right on the, I'm sitting right on the aisle. Like I'm ready, I'm ready to get out of my seat and go up on stage. Cause I think the special thing probably has something to do with me being special. 
you know, <laughs> so I'm just thinking, you know, he's going to call all us kids up on stage. At some point, I was convinced of it. I thought it was going to be to do a song or something. Went to the end of the service. They're giving the end invitation just as I am. And we're, we're literally looking down at me. It looks like everything's wrapping up here, Shane. <laughs> yep, sure enough. He called up the benediction and the guy came up and prayed and that was it. Nothing special happened. Except this one thing. That became our church home. Seeds of faith were planted in me over and over and over again. Calvary Baptist Church. <laughs> Don't despise the day of small beginnings. When you have a great God. It's not an accident that you're watching right now. You know, it's, I, I've heard people talking about church and how hard it is to go to church and how difficult it is to go to church. And uh, I, I remember we had to go. Like, and I remember back when the gas crisis happened back in, I don't know, late 70s or so. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but my dad bought a Honda, the very first Honda Civic or something like that. Uh, Honda, oh yeah, it was a Honda Civic. And it was an orange Honda Civic. And six of us had to fit in this car. Let me tell you. And it was a 40-minute drive one way to church because of the church that I happened to pick happened to be 40 minutes away from our horse farm. And so we're driving in from the country to go to this church outside of Philadelphia. And we got to drive all the way into town. And let me tell you, sitting in the back, with not three people, that's not even supposed to fit three people, but four kids. Four of us in the back of a Honda Civic. We looked like one of those clown cars when we got to church pouring out of every, every orifice of this car. But it was ingrained in me that we go. And I paid a price because my brothers beat me up the whole way, that 40 minutes, like fighting. and chatting. My dad's arm would come back every now and then while he's driving. And we, we had a rough time trying to get to church, but we got there and that got ingrained in me. And let me tell you, I ingrained that in my kids. And we went no matter what. I've planted churches, not as a pastor, as a volunteer, running a business, working 60, 80 hours a week, getting on Sunday, getting up at six in the morning, loading a trailer, pulling them up. You know who else got up at six in the morning? The two kids we happen to have with us at the time too, who were just a toddler and a baby. And they got up at six in the morning with us. You know what we did? We were horrible parents. We racked them, up, pulled them in. We sat them. They slept in hallways. They slept in cars. They slept. And we didn't go home till six p.m. that night. We're horrible parents. We, we said we're going no matter what. We take them on vacation. We take them wherever. Sunday was a time we'd make them miss soccer games and we'd make them miss uh, things because like, hey, we've got, we've got to be there. This has got to be a priority. It wasn't like a rule, like you're out of my house if you don't live by my rules. It was something that was ingrained in us. And let me tell you, it wasn't a rule for them. It was a way of life for us. And there's a huge difference and every kid knows what it is. It is. You know what? Today, I've got those young adults that beat every single odd. My youngest called me last night telling me, yeah, he's driving. He got assigned young life. He's ministering to a middle school 40 minutes away from campus one way. That's 80 minutes back and forth. And he's going to go there several times a week. And I said, every single minute of that drive is worth it. If you need help with it, let me know. I'll get you there. We will find a way you do that because every single one of those miles is a mile that lasts forever. And for the kingdom of heaven, let me tell you the school that you're doing, the studies you're doing. What are you doing telling him not to study? I'm telling you, put your priorities. Lay up your treasure in heaven. 
My middle son is in a doctorate program where they work like 80 hours a week nonstop. It is insane. Nobody takes time out to go to church. He doesn't just go to church. He serves in the worship team. He's a drummer in the worship team. He goes to rehearsals and goes to practice on top of that. And on top of that, my oldest son who just got married, my beautiful daughter-in-law now in the family, they're coming to our church now and, and I'll take it forever time it is. You know, you plant these seeds. They're young adults who defy all the millennial rules. Oh, you're such great parents. You're bragging on your kids. I'm bragging on a great God and a seed this big. Parents, don't be afraid to plant it, to push it, to drive it because it's a seed from heaven. Don't make it a rule. Make it a way of life of you. And mom and dad, this is important. This isn't a parenting class, but I'm telling you, it's so that, so that, the birds will come one day. You plant a seed. You watch it grow so that the birds will come and rest on the branches and the shade will be and provided and you will impact generations to come. It isn't just you who gives that. You will plant a seed when you show that mom and dad or in your household, if you're single now, you don't make a lot of money because you give to God first. You make that a priority. Now, my 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 kids are gi giving to God. They support their own compassion children. They give to other people. They're changing the world. Why? Because they're such great kids. No, because we serve a great God and you just have to have this much faith. <laughs> now, I'm amazed of what God can do. Our very first missions trip Peyton Harris was on that trip. He became a missionary, but not before he went on his second trip. He went on his second trip. And on that trip, he started dating his wife, Clover. And the two of them have served all over the round in the world in the Muslim community. And now pastors, one of our partner churches, River of Life, ministering in the Muslim community and right here in Glen Allen. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Plant a seed. Watch it grow so that, not just for you, but for those who will come. One of my favorite ministries the West End Assembly of God is intertwined ministries. You can go and follow them on Instagram and Facebook and social media. And uh, it's a ministry that, that we formed and, uh, with a team of people who take and foster and adopt children. And when they do that, they, you don't have to necessarily foster or adopt children, but you can wrap around families and you can be a part, and you don't have to do everything, but you can do something for the most vulnerable because every time you sit and you do something for the most vulnerable in the world, you plant a seed in your field of the kingdom of heaven so that some of you who've taken on and taken children into your home, whether temporarily or they became, you became, you went from, uh, some of you went to a, from fostering to adoption. Some of you go around and wrap around. Some of you have provided for that adoption. Some of you have stepped into our compassion with our compassion ministry partnership and began to sponsor children and, and support others around the world. And, and you've planted that seed because every single time you step into that place, plant a seed. Every time you sit in a struggle and you choose to have faith over fear, you plant a seed. Every time you wrestle in a tension and a trial, but you allow that trial to become your transformation, it, you plant a seed. Every time you have resistance and in that resistance in a relationship, you choose the relationship over the resistance and you choose the relationship over being right, you plant a seed. Every single time that you uh, have the opportunity to repay 
evil with good. You plant a seed every time you serve the need of a, a vulnerable person, of someone who has a need. Every time you come and you write that check, every time you come and bring that meal, every time you come and pray for that person, every prayer that you pray, every word that you read from his, it plants a seed and it will grow so that... This is how Paul said it. And I'll close with this. What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. Those are the who planted the church in Corinth. Paul did. Apollos came and pastored later. He said, as the Lord assigned to each of us his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. But God has been making it grow. Let me ask you a question. Are you planting any seeds today? Are you planting any seeds in your field? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's just a small thing. But when it grows, it becomes the largest of all garden plants then becomes a tree so that the birds can rest, so that generations to come can be impacted because of your small faith and our great God. Would you pray with me right now? God, often I pray for the large things. I pray for the big things. God, right to now, today, I want to pray for the small things. Right now. If you're watching online and you, you've never crossed a line of faith and you and say, I don't know that I've ever declared Jesus as Lord of my life and planted that seed. And right now, I want to give you an opportunity to do just that. I want to pray with you. That same prayer I prayed in that camp outside. You can pray to the Lord. Paul said that if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. It's just a small thing. But maybe that's one small thing you're willing to do right now. If you will do that, if you're watching online, you can click and raise your hand. If you don't have chat, you can just pray this prayer to yourself. If you're sitting right here, you can pray this prayer to yourself right now in your own words. Jesus, you did a big thing in coming and dying for me. I want to do a small thing right now and ask you to forgive me of my sin, to come and be my Savior. Because you are alive today, give me new life as well. Right now, if you prayed that prayer, we want to come alongside you as a church. Just help you do some small things that will turn into big things when God is involved. I want to ask, invite you to pray another prayer. Those of you who've been following Jesus for some time, you say, what do you believe in God for? What are you worried about right now? Where is your stress? Where is your own anxiety? And where is your faith right now? If you'll do the small thing, God will do the big things, not because of your great faith, but because he's a great God. Would you just right now in a prayer say, God, I'm going to do a small thing. I'm just going to every day do small things. I'm just going to pray. I'm going to trust you with the big things. I'm going to trust you with the one seed I'm planting right now. Lord, would you, I'm going to let it grow. I'm going to, I'm going to cultivate it. I'm going to water it. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to, I'm going to let it grow so that 
you can use all these small things together to do something great that can only come in the economy of heaven and your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Hey, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media accounts. You want to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to stay connected and grow in your faith.